let's crack on then, shall we? Yeah, yeah. So, um, we'll open in prayer, shall we? Perhaps, uh, Pat, would you open in prayer for us? Um, yeah, I'll okay. Go on, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for this evening mm -hmm. that we can meet together and study your word. And we ask that you will bless us while we study it so that we can make good use of it. Mm -hmm. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Super. So, um, first, uh, sorry, Second Corinthians, chapter one. And. Yeah. We're, yeah, that's right, yeah. Well, I think we did, is it 13, 14? Paul did last week, didn't he? So we're, we're go, what we're going to do is 15 to 24 tonight. Mm, yeah, so I know, I thought I'd really go for it. Yeah. Um, Chris, would you read those verses? Yeah, that's good. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 15 to the end of the chapter, that is. And in the confidence was minded to come unto you before, that ye might have a second benefit, and to pass by you into Macedonia, and to come again out of Macedonia unto you, and owe you to be brought on my way towards Judea. When I therefore was <coughs> thus minded, did I use likeness or the things that I propose purpose do I purpose according to the flesh that with me there should be yea yea and nay nay <clears throat> but as God is true our word toward you was not yea and nay for the Son of God Jesus Christ who was preached among you by us even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. <clears throat> For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him are men, unto the glory of God by us. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us, is God. Who hath, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I come not as yet unto Corinth. Not for that we have do, dominion over your faith, and are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. Super, thank you very much. <coughs> okay, so that's the, <coughs> the verses for tonight. Um, so, just looking at verse 15, um, Paul says, In this confidence I was minded to come unto you before that you might have a second benefit. So, do you recall, in 1 Corinthians, Paul had said, I'm coming. I'm coming to see you, Corinth. Um, but he's actually slightly delayed, and so he's from verse 15 up to about verse 18 trying to say to them i'm keeping my word i am coming to see you my yes is yes my yay is yay not nay um so he, he he will visit them in fact he's already planned his itinerary according to verse 16 he's going to pass by into macedonia uh, and on the, that way visit them and then on the way back He's going to visit them again. Um, and in fact, he's asking that they might bring him his way toward Judea, which may be a reference, as we looked at when we did First Corinthians, about uh, money, basically, about uh, supporting his ministry on the way back to Jerusalem. Okay, so that gives us the background. But of course, there's more to this than than just the fact that Paul is saying, I'm going to keep my promise. It says something about us and about, well, verse 15. This is the point I really wanted to focus on. Paul says, 
that ye might have a second benefit. Now just think about that again. Paul is saying to the Corinthians, I'm coming, and I'm coming that you might have a second benefit. Now that, um, in if it weren't for Paul's uh, ministry or apostleship, might sound a little arrogant. I'm on my way to benefit you for a second time. Mm -hmm. I'm coming again for, for a second benefit. You're going to benefit from my visit. But of course Paul can have that confidence because of, well, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 19. How is it that Paul can can be so bold as to say my visit will be to your advantage to your benefit well 1 Corinthians 4.19 says but I will come to you shortly if the Lord will and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up but the power so there's the promise again about visiting Corinth and notice he compares himself to those that call themselves apostles those that call themselves teachers in Corinth he says not like them that are puffed up that are full of their own self-importance self-knowledge rather I come with the power and what power is that verse 20 for the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. The power of the gospel, the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is why it's important when we go about any kind of ministry, any kind of service in the church, that we evaluate are we doing this in the power that is the power of God or could we actually be doing it in the flesh which is something entirely different imagine if you were digging a hole for example say you've got to dig a great hole here and uh, the soil you've got to work away at it <clears throat> Imagine if you did that in your own strength. That's tiring. Uh, it's toil. It's onerous. And at the end of it, you're shattered. But if you have a mechanical digger, and you're using you know, the mechanics of that, well, the job is so much easier. You just get out of the cab, don't you? And you're fine. You're as right as rain. And that really is the difference between doing it in your power and doing it in the Lord's power. It's something totally different. And of course, if you are doing it in the flesh, there's another issue, and that is that who's in control? If you're doing it in the flesh, you're in control. But if you're doing it in the power, well, God's in control. He's the one that's, that's driving it. He's the one uh, who's accomplishing what his will is rather than our own <clears throat> and so if you're evangelizing if you're teaching if you're preaching is it by Jesus that's the question to ask it, is it by Jesus otherwise there, there isn't that much benefit you can't really stand there and be as Paul and say there is this benefit to you a second benefit and although we don't wish to become arrogant or conceited in our, in our uh, mission, in our gifts, hopefully we're able to say whatever we're doing, we're doing it because God's told us to do it, because God's in it, because it's done uh, in his strength rather than our own. This is also picked up in verse uh, 17 when he says when I therefore was thus minded did I use lightness see the opposite to power 
So when I promised that I would be on my way, did I use lightness? People use lightness all the time, don't they? Mm -hmm. They lightly say things. This is what I'm going to do for you. This is what I'm going to set out to do. But many times they fail. Or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh? You see, is it done in the spirit or is it done in the flesh? That with me there should be yea, yea and nay, nay. In other words, that vacillating, that fickleness between yes and no, being undecided. Uh, that kind of instability that can happen to a Christian who sets out to do something but doesn't accomplish it, doesn't see it through, doesn't fulfil it because there's a yes and a no about them, an indecisiveness, an indecision. Why? Because it's been purposed in the flesh rather than in the spirit. God was never there to begin with basically. And so it's important when we start to look at what we're doing in the church, what is our purpose, if you like, as a member. Remember, each of us is a member. What is our membership? What is our function in the church? We've said this uh, almost time and again, haven't we, about we need to s evaluate what are our gifts and are we using them uh, to the full? <clears throat> but also... What aren't our gifts? Because if it isn't a gift, then is it being done in the flesh? Well, yes it is actually, because unless it's gifted of God, then, it, then it's, it's not meant to be. So, 18, God is true. Our word toward you was not yea and nay. God is true. And that's who we need to focus on. God. Go back to God. Any indecision, any inconclusiveness about what we're meant to be doing, go to God. Ask Him. Now how do you do that practically? Because it's so easy to shift, even as a Christian, between the flesh and the spirit and to get all a bit muddled up and confused in life as to what we're meant to be doing with this life. Because it is this life as well. It's not just about going to heaven and being with the Lord. The Lord has things for us to do here as well. What I thought I would do is hand out some of these. See what you think. Just pass some of these around. Now let's just quickly run through this, and we can do it scripturally as well, but um, this pyramid, um, don't worry it's not the Illuminati for any conspiracy <laughs> theorists, <laughs> um, but this pyramid pretty much describes human makeup, how we are made, how God has arranged us. Now he's arranged us so as to have a spirit, uh, to a soul and a body. Now the body's pretty obvious isn't it? That's the, the body in front of us, the physical isn't it? And through the body we can interact with the world around us. And we get information through the senses it says. So you know we have the five senses don't we? Now, the, the body informs the soul. Now, if you start to do a word study of the soul um, throughout the Bible, you'll discover that quite often it's associated with the mind, with the will, and with the emotions. So that part of you that is psychological, that thinks and that has feeling and emotion, that's your soul, okay? And then we have this 
special part of us which is termed the spirit and the spirit we find in scripture is often that part that is related to God that we use to communicate with God praying in the spirit maybe you've you've heard of that and who can know the things of God except the spirit of God which is in where man's own spirit okay which is uh, in first Corinthians all right but there's a problem unless you're born again this part here this part here the spirit is dead this part here has no relationship with God now can we can we go about and prove that well let's just look at some scriptures um, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 we find chapter 2 and verse 1 and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins dead in trespasses and sins so just a minute when these Christians did not know God they were described as being dead in trespasses and sins. Well, they weren't physically dead, were they? They still were alive in their body and their soul. They had a mind to think and a body to, to use. But what was dead was this part, this spirit. This part of man that is able to communicate with God. Verse 12 talks about that again. That at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world so there again without God in the world having no so are you chapter 2 yeah alright chapter 2 verse uh, 12 okay if we turn over to Galatians chapter 4 and verse 8. And it says, How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. In other words, when you didn't know God, that is, when this was dead, the spirit, and you were just in your soul and body, when you knew not God, you did service to other gods. And how true that is. A fleshly person, a person who is, as we read earlier, is alien from God, a person who is in soul and body, but this bit is still dead, what do they do with their lives? They serve other gods, don't they? They, as Paul rightly says in Galatians 4 verse 8, do service to other deities, other gods. Those other gods might be wealth, might be their career. It might be a false god, literally, a false religion. This is the problem when man is alienated from God so <clears throat> what can we do to be a stable Christian well firstly this has to be awakened doesn't it there's absolutely no point in doing Christian things in following this even um, by the letter if this hasn't been awakened 
Because if God's Holy Spirit has not come to live in you, the believer, what is the problem? Even if you're still going to church, even if you're involved in uh, church life and supporting uh, the body of Christ, well, the problem is that you have no communion with God. Now, you think you do, because we're told that the soul or the heart is quite deceptive. We can think to ourselves, I'm all right, I'm a religious person, I go to church, I do good, I feed the homeless and so forth, or whatever it is you do. But don't be tricked by that. That is actually the man, alien from God, thinking they're right with him, when in fact they've never experienced the anointing, the Holy Spirit, the presence, the indwelling. God's Holy Spirit in the temple of the body. There's so much about that, isn't there, in the New Testament? In fact, think of Christ. Did he perform miracles before his anointing? No. After he was anointed by Holy Spirit, did he then go and, 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 and do his miracles? And he said the same to his disciples. You know, he won't be able to do anything until the anointing. In Acts chapter 2, that's what happens. The Holy Spirit comes down out of heaven and anoints those Christians. When do you say he was anointed? Who? Christ. Well, he was anointed in baptism. Oh, sorry, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. So, <coughs> this is vitally important because you could be journeying throughout life in this, this sort of circle, thinking everything's okay, but in fact, you've never had the direct revelation of Holy Spirit that awakens you. Now, can we prove that actually happens? That's what's got to happen. We can. Go to Romans chapter 8, one of the most famous chapters in Scripture. And in verse 15 it says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Verse 16, The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Go back to verse 9 as well. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. It's as straightforward as that. So, <coughs> chapter 8 is helpful in that it also describes the division between, um, between those, uh, the division that can occur in a Christian who has the spirit but can remain in the flesh and not access the spirit. And that is where there is a indecision. There is an instability in that Christian. Because what they haven't learned to do is follow the arrow, allow the spirit to fill their soul, their body, their entire being, so that God is in control rather than than they themselves in control. And that's why each day we have to get up, don't we, and say to God in the morning, today I die. Today I pick up my cross and follow you. Today I, this is me here, just 
in the flesh, soul and body, say no. No, I'm not going to be in control, just me. But I'm going to let your Holy Spirit, in my spirit, control my thoughts, my mind, will and emotions, and of course, my body. And that is the great war that we have, isn't it? Between flesh and spirit. When we become a Christian and we have the Holy Spirit living in us, do we sense more and more of this this pull of the flesh here but thankfully the convicting of the spirit saying or knocking on our hearts if you like and saying let me in I want to take uh, control so for Philippians chapter 4 verse 13 nicely sums up the course of a successful Christian um, If he remains in the spirit. Verse 13 of chapter 4 says. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. But do you notice beforehand in verse 12. What is it that he's able to withstand? He says, I know both how to be abased, I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Back to our diagram. Hunger, the body. Yeah. Abased, low in emotions, low in our feelings. Afflicted, according to verse 14. Affliction? Well, the body decays, doesn't it? It grows hold, it gets creaky, um, it deteriorates. But I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So the question is in life, if we are really struggling with, with particular issues, that are related to our soul, maybe it's depression, anxiety, melancholy, whatever, and in the body. Stand on what God is saying here. All things can be done through Christ. All things can be done in the strength of Christ. Not some things, all things. The question is, is it happening? Are you allowing that to happen? Are you allowing Christ to do all things? By him living in your spirit, you repenting, that is turning to him, turning to him and letting him flood you with his Holy Spirit through soul and body. You see, and if we are living that way, then... Yes, uh, we, we will face tribulation and trial and it, it will be difficult at times, but it will be possible. Through God, all things are possible. But it's about knowing what you're doing in your body, about knowing your makeup. And there's an essential part of you, your spirit, which was awakened at new birth, born again. The Holy Spirit came down to live in there and need to live in there so that God can accomplish anything he wants to through you. Are you accessing that? Are you living in that spirit? Okay. So uh, this nicely rounds off the chapter actually. Um, for Second Corinthians chapter 1. And... Verse 21 says, Now he which establisheth us, sorry, now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. There it is, in the Spirit, the anointing. God living in you 
Verse 22, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. There it is. It's already in you. But are you accessing it? Are you living in the Spirit? You know that word earnest means pledge or security or deposit. Already living in the believer is God. And he lives in you as a pledge, as a down payment to say, you're going to be in heaven. Your inheritance is with me. But the question is, are we dissatisfied with that and think, well, I'd rather just be back, be with the Lord and get this over and done with? Or are we prepared to say, no, that is enough. That pledge is enough. That Holy Spirit is enough. I can do all things in that. Why? So that you're ready in God's time to go to heaven and so that you're ready now in God's time for him to do his work in you because the life of a Christian is about shaping about moulding about disciplining and about refining that's it it's not just about let's get it over and done with and go to be with, with God God wants to use you now and he wants to shape you now ready for his kingdom but that means we have to just we have to yield and surrender to him and let him do his work and when i say god has things to do for you now just remember what we've learned in the past about the gifts of the spirit about what god wants us to do god just doesn't want us to preach and teach that's a that's not true. He just, you know, I mean, those are fundamental. They're so important. But if you go to Romans 12, Romans 12 says there's exhortation, there's giving, there's leadership, there's mercy, there's service. Those are gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12 says that there's gifts of administration, discernment, faith, healing, helps, knowledge, Miracles, tongues, tongues interpretation, wisdom. In Ephesians, there's evangelism, there's pastoring, there's prophecy, and there's teaching. Now, when you start to think like that, you put it all together, do you then appreciate there's a lot more to the church of God than just preaching and teaching? We need to start to look at what are we doing. What is our gift and are we using it to the full now for the body of Christ? Think on those things. Just think, which of those gifts applies to you? You know, even if it's just making a cup of tea. Well, you could class that as helps. Even if it's just uh, getting the church painted. Well, that's administration. But there's also... You know, those sort of abstract gifts like discernment, like faith, healing even. Healing's down there as well. Tongues. There's lots of things to be getting on with before Christ's coming. It's not about jam tomorrow. It isn't. It's not about just looking for Jesus, oh, come now. Well, Jesus actually has massive work to do through us here and now even in Stockport and of course it can it can be done but uh, will we will we yield will we surrender and say thy will be done Christ the head so that is um, the end nearly but verse 24 just to make sure not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith you stand. So it's all to the end, all of this is all to the end of helping you in your walk, in your faith, in your joy. 
uh, with the Lord, isn't it? That's what it's about. So we'll fit there. We'll uh, finish. <laughs>